Yeah. <laughs> Good evening and welcome to CSIS. The book is The House at Sugar Beach. It's by Helene Cooper who sits here with me. Helene uh, wrote this book and she's also the New York Times correspondent uh, at the White House now. Yes. Has been in the past the State Department correspondent. Um, I urge all of you to buy multiple copies. They're being multiple sold. Multiple <laughs> copies. <laughs> They're being sold in the back. Um, this book is fantastic, and I hope um, all of you who haven't read it uh, will take the opportunity to read it. Um, it's it's Helene's search for her lost African childhood, and it's a book that I realized after I read it that she absolutely had to write. It was it, it was required? You had to do this. Right. So you're taking away all my, my talking points. You're supposed to say, why well, did you write the book? And then I'll say, well, actually, you know, the, the issue was, why did it take me so long to write the book? <laughs> why did it take but, you so long? Um, I, you know, I, I, I haven't really answered that question satisfactorily for myself. It's this story that I sort of had inside me for 23 years. Um, and I think for many of those years, I was hiding. Uh, I didn't want to deal with, with Liberia. I didn't want to deal with a lot of what had happened when my family had left. A few years ago, I think it was around two, somewhere in 2000, some friends of mine and I went to Oxford, Maryland, to this crab shack uh, over the Bay Bridge. And it was a beautiful, beautiful um, afternoon, uh, evening. We had cut out our work early. And we're sitting on the water, drinking cold beer and eating crab. And I said something about how my ancestors were actually originally from, part, some of them were from the eastern shore of Maryland. Mm -hmm. And my friends are all reporters, and they're looking at me like, you're from Liberia, what do you mean your ancestors are from the eastern shore of Maryland? And I said, well, actually, I started to tell them about, you know, my great-great-great-great-great-grandfather, Elijah Johnson, who was on the first ship that sailed of freed slaves and freed American blacks, who sailed to Liberia in 1820, and I told them about how my father's side there were four Cooper brothers who sailed from Norfolk to Liberia in 1826. I told them about how these freed blacks founded um, uh, Liberia, the first independent African country. Uh, and I told them a little bit about how, you know, the irony was that these freed blacks set up the same kind of antebellum society that they had fled from in the United States. Um, I told them about how they established themselves as the elite in Liberia, and they built this country. But at the same time, you had so many members of the Liberian population, most of the, the what they call the native Liberians, who were not taking part in this wealth at all. I was born in 1966 into this so-called elite, basically with a silver spoon in my mouth. And uh, I told them about how all of this sort of came to a head in 1980 when a group of soldiers uh, um, uh, staged a military coup overthrowing the, the so-called Congo regime about how my uncle was executed on the beach by firing squad, my family was attacked, and we ran away. You saw and this execution on TV. I did, that night. So I'm sitting in Oxford, Maryland, telling my friends this whole sort of Cliff Notes version, and they're looking at me, and they kept saying, why haven't you written this? You're a reporter. Why haven't you written this? And I said it's complicated, which is a really kind of lame answer. But at the time, I knew that I could never really write this book or write this story until I first reconciled myself with my separation from my sister, my adopted sister who we had left behind, Eunice, uh, when my family ran away in 1980. And so the House of Sugar Beach uh, couldn't be written until I first went back and found her. And Eunice was the adopted sister who, when you moved into Sugar Beach, uh, the house that your father built, um, after years of living in Monrovia, in the urban areas, you moved out to the sort of the country, the suburbs. But you were the your family was the pioneer of the suburbs. We were, work. yeah, we thought we were, we were urban pioneers. We thought that, you know, development would follow us. I was, I hated moving out to Sugar Beach. I was right. seven years old and it was the back of beyond as far as I was concerned. It was 11 miles outside of Monrovia. We were way in the bush. We didn't have, we had electricity, but we didn't have a telephone, which you can imagine at seven. It's like, 
you know, my dad would just look and said, who do you think you're going to call? It's like, I want to call my friends. Um, but we didn't have, and I just felt, we felt really, you know, I felt isolated. Um, I was, uh, by the time I turned eight, you know, I was terrified to sleep alone in my room at night. I was convinced that Hartman and Niji and um, uh, witch doctors and all the, the, the superstitious stuff that we all grew up with in Liberia. And I was convinced they were all going to come into my bedroom at night and get me. Um, and so after, you know, months of me climbing into my parents' room, you know, at night and refusing to sleep by myself, my parents did what a lot of people in Liberia did. And they went out and they put out the word that their now eight-year-old daughter needed a live-in playmate. And Eunice's mother, a uh, Basel woman, uh, brought Eunice to live with us. This was one of those things that often happened in Liberia where uh, the native Liberians would bring their kids to live with the so-called Congo people because they knew their kids would get three square meals a day and a chance at education. And this was, again, part of this sort of class structure. So Eunice and I, from that moment, were raised as sisters, although the entire time we were raised together, we both knew we were different. But you also were incredibly close, and unlike some other families, Congo families in Liberia, your parents really regarded um, Eunice as, a, as another daughter, and, and she was really a sister to you and Marlene, so much so that in a 22-bedroom house, all three of you most of the time slept in the same room. Well, that's because we're all terrified of the Hartman and Niji and Voodoo people. Um, yeah, we did. We all slept in the same room. And it's because we were like, you know, Eunice had her own room. I had my own room. Marlene had her own room. Marlene was right over there. Um, and we would drag our mattresses down the hallway every night into Eunice and I into Marlene's room because we figured if we were together, nobody would get us. Um, you have to remember, let me back up a second because you guys are going to think I'm psycho. Um, uh, we, our house got burgled every other day. Um, rogues, we call them rogues in Liberia and as burglars, and they would come in the middle of the night when you're asleep, and they'd break into the house, and they would take off. You know, this is so on PC, but my mom was collecting ivory, and they would cart off her ivory, and then, you know, two days later, the Madingo men who sold her the ivory would come back with more ivory. She would buy it from them, put it back up, and two days later, the rogues would come back and take it away. And it's like, I was convinced that the Madingo men who sold her the ivory were in cahoots You were the, the one rose. that figured out the plot. Hello, the family, yes. Right. 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 But anyway, so uh, there, there was a little bit of method to our madness of being yeah. convinced. But it, a lot of this also was we would be in the room at night and just telling scary so, uh, stories. And Eunice would terrify us with stories about the underwater spirits, the Niji who come into the lagoon when you're swimming at Sugar Beach and suck you under and take you off to God knows where. And we sort of grew up with, this was part of the whole African childhood where we grew up with these, these stories. And I look back at it now with this incredible fondness. But at the time, I was terrified. It was very real to you. It was very real to me. Well, you know, the book is your search for your lost African childhood, but it really traces the history of your family going back to the 1800s. Uh, which you've mentioned before, you know, what, what, which also parallels the history of Liberia. What, the whole book is intertwined with the history of Liberia and the history of your family. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, my four greats, great, 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 great grandfather was um, Elijah Johnson. He was, when he was, he was, he got on that boat uh, in 1820, the Elizabeth. He'd been a soldier. He had fought in the War of 1812. He was a freed black. He'd been born free. Um, uh, and I haven't traced his parentage, but he was never a slave. But anyway, he was on the first ship. This was during the Back to Africa movement in the early 1800s, where the rationale here was that you couldn't have freed blacks living in the U.S. at the same time that you had enslaved blacks because they were setting the wrong example. Uh, you, you don't want all the black people thinking that you could be free. So the best way to, to get to solve that issue was to get rid of the freed blacks and send them back to Africa. And my great, 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 great grandfather volunteered to get on the ship. There were 88 of them. And they docked at Sierra Leone. Uh, they were there for, t for two years. They sailed around the West African coast looking for land and they finally ended up in Liberia and so uh, they were uh, as they were building their houses and their settlements they were attacked by the native Africans uh, there was a lot of fighting my grand Elijah Johnson was a soldier he trained the men he stood up for the you know I was raised to be enormously proud proud of him um, but at the same time they did these guys uh, these settlers came to Liberia uh, thinking that's because some of them could read and write uh, that they were civilized. 
and that the, they looked at the Native Africans at the time as not civilized. And there was this class structure that was set up from the get-go to their, you know, I don't want to paint them as complete, I don't want to paint this as completely black and white because at the time, a lot of the Native Africans were still engaged in the slave trade. And the settlers, the first thing they did was to abolish the slave trade in Liberia, and that was sort of the economic livelihood. And a lot of the tension came from that, but so, because they got rid of this economic mainstay, but they couldn't stand to see people being sold into slavery at the same time that these Native Africans, a lot of them were still selling their brothers and sisters. But from the start, there was sort of this, this tension between these two groups. Um, and Liberia sort of developed from there. So it was sort of for a long time, as I grew up, uh, you know, we looked at ourselves as, um, it's so ironic now looking back at it, we looked at ourselves as looked at, I, I would look at other African countries and think, oh, look at the coup in Ghana and the coup this place. And, you know, we're not like that. We're, you know, we thought we were the sort of the ideal in Africa and this is where, you know, everybody. But in reality, you know, the only, the, the biggest difference between Liberia and the other African countries is that Liberia was colonized by black people, whereas every, the other African countries were colonized by white people. But you had the same type of, you know, the blacks that colonized Liberia in many ways acted like the Europeans did. And your, your ancestor, Elijah Johnson, was the George Washington of Liberia. He was one of the real founders. And on the other side of the family, um, your relative, the Dennis family, uh, was also one of yeah. the pioneers. Yeah, the Dennis family uh, and the Johnson family on my, my, my mother's side, and then on the, my father's side, the Cooper family, Cooper family, where there were four Cooper brothers uh, who got on a ship in 1826, the Harriet. Uh, that sailed from Norfolk, and they they went to Liberia, and they were businessmen. Uh, they set up, you know, and they went into you know sort of commercial, whereas the uh, the other side of my family was more into government. But um, so from both both uh, both my mom and my my dad's side is sort of um, it's all there. And as things got bad in Liberia, you were there for when it got really bad. And you fled in 1980 with your mother and, and Marlene. Um, and you didn't return until 23 years later, as we talked about, um, when you'd already made a life for yourself as a reporter in the United States, as a college graduate. Um, you lived in several cities. Why did you go back? What made you go back after all those years? When you had seen such terrible things happen to mm -hmm. your family and to your home and to your country? We came here, and I was 14 years old, and you know I was in the 10th grade, and I went to school, uh, American high school. It was pretty horrible the first year or so. I didn't make friends. This is in um, Knoxville. Yeah, Knoxville, Tennessee, and then we moved to Greensboro to live with my dad. My parents had divorced by then. Uh, my mother went back to Liberia, uh, and then you know the Liberia sort of descended during the 1980s and then the early 1990s into this ninth circle of hell where you had. Doe was killed, the guy who had instigated the coup, uh, Charles Taylor invaded, and the country descended into civil war. And my mother came back here. And sort of the way I dealt with it was to cut it off. I, um, uh, the, I got to thinking that Liberia wasn't a place where you lived. It was a place where you died. My dad had gone back home in 1985. In 1984, he died nine months after he got back to Liberia. My uncle died. I saw all the killing, and you sort of see on the image the images coming um, out of the TV of Liberia, which is my way. You know, it's it sort of it's very much a, a, a you know it's a running. Away. I ran away from it, and I became much more American. I perfected my American accent. I got a job uh, after college with first the Providence Journal as a newspaper reporter, then the Wall Street Journal, and I traveled all over the world. Writing about you know everything from Cambodia to Haiti to you know everything except Liberia. I felt like if I you know I, I couldn't deal with Liberia, so if I just in my head killed off everybody who was still in Liberia who I loved, then it wouldn't hurt me when they got killed, which is not a very healthy way to deal with with it. And it all sort of came crashing down on me in 2003 in Iraq. Um, I was in Iraq for the um, invasion embedded with the 3rd Infantry Division. Um, and I felt this at the time... This is the front line. The 3rd yes, ID was yes, the first yeah, yeah. in. And during the 
you know, I, I, during the war, I really felt physically like I was in the wrong place and what, this was the wrong war. And on uh, one night in Iraq, my Humvee got run over by a tank and I was pinned to the wheel. Uh, there, you know, the soldiers are there screaming and I still remember I couldn't move and they're screaming, medevac, medevac, she's bleeding out, she's bleeding out. And I really did think that this was it, I, I, was, I was dying. Uh, they finally pulled me out of the Humvee and I'm standing, I'm, they spread me on the sand and I'm lying on my back. And all I could think of is if I'm gonna die in a war, I should die in a war in my own country. And for, it was pretty much, that was pretty much it for me. This, I was in Iraq when at the very same time Liberia was seizing up again in another horrible civil war. I didn't know where my sister Eunice, I hadn't talked to her in 15 years, didn't know if she was dead or alive. All this stuff was happening in my own country and I was in Iraq. And it was just, it, I, I think it all just sort of boiled over. And you lost touch with Eunice because um, not only was Liberia under the you know, power of, of dictators like Samuel Doe and then subsequently Charles Taylor, but the country was virtually destroyed. There was no electricity, There's no, no yeah, running water. You couldn't water call, there were no telephones. You couldn't, you know, you, in order to write somebody, Eunice and I wrote very a lot when we first moved here. Um, but as, it, the, as the mail system got destroyed, it got to the point where in order to contact or reach somebody in Liberia, you had to find somebody who was physically going them there and give them a letter. And it just got, you know, from, which is, it sounds so like lame, but it just got too hard. You know, I couldn't, it was so hard to find her and so hard to keep, keep in touch. But that's not really much an, of an excuse. And I think all of that, this whole feeling of abandonment, that I had abandoned my sister. Um, and here I am gallivanting around the world as this reporter and you know God knows what what has happened to her sort of came down on me as well. B before we talk about uh, a little bit about what you found when you did go back, uh, you, you Helene, you tapped into some really painful memories to write this book um, and, and, and I think it took a lot of courage on your part to do that. What were, what were the hardest things that you had to revisit and, and including of course leaving Eunice? I'm not a really introspective person. Um, one of the ways that I've always dealt with things is to just shut it down and keep going. Something bad happens and you just shut it down and you move on. And that was the way sort of I dealt with the coup, uh, the way I dealt with my family members being executed on the beach. My mother was raped, gang raped uh, at the time by soldiers who were trying to get to us. She basically traded herself for her daughters. Um, and in so many things that have happened in life, the way I dealt with it was just to like, you know, you keep going, you paper over it and you pretend, you don't pretend it doesn't happen, but you don't focus on it. Um, so when I finally sat down to focus on it, that was probably my biggest challenge because I found, this book took me four years to write. And I, the first couple of years I was still trying to paper over everything. I was trying to write it just the facts, man. I wrote it, you know, I wrote the first draft the way I, you know, as a journalist, just this happened and this happened and this happened and this happened, you know, and I almost, it was almost, I was cheating. I felt like I was, it was almost as if I was trying to see if I could get away without digging because, and that was probably one of the hardest things is going back and realizing that it doesn't mean anything if I don't dig and go back and it sort of feels like a scab that you keep, you know, it heals over and you go back and you dig and know how did you actually heal and why did you do this? And why did you behave this way? And why did you not go back before this to look for your sister? Why did you let her go? Why did you, you know, and that I think was probably the hardest thing for me because it's not, that doesn't come naturally to me. Tell us about when you actually left Liberia and you had to leave um, Eunice behind, you and your mother and Marlene um, went to Roberts Field Airport and got on, a, got on a plane. There were direct flights from Monrovia yeah, yeah. to Pan Am. Yeah, yeah, Pan Am flights. Tell us what happened. Um, my mom had just been raped and brutalized. My uncle had been executed. My father had been shot. Um, and we were pretty traumatized. And this was all, this all happened within a one week period of the coup. Uh, two weeks later, uh, we left. My mom and my dad, my dad was still in the hospital. Uh, decided that they were going to get the kids out and that my dad would come when his wound had healed. Um, they asked Eunice, my mom asked Eunice to come with us and she said no. Her, she still kept in touch with her mom. 
Uh, she was never formally adopted by us. She just lived with us, and she was about to graduate from high school, and she didn't want to leave her mother just then. And I think we all thought, oh, she'll come after she graduates in December. It will only be a few months. You know, you're going off into the unknown, and you don't, you know, in my mind, I thought she would be following us. To go to college in America, like yeah, you all were going. Yeah, yeah. But we were, we got here, and we were basically, you know, African refugees. We didn't have any money, and it's, it's like things sort of get away from you. And then my mother went back home, and then the whole idea of Eunice coming just sort of dissipated. Um, that night at Robertsville when we left, um, uh, I remember me and Marlene and my mom got on the plane, uh, Pan Am. Uh, I still remember, it's really funny, whenever I walk onto a plane now, I can smell this is this antiseptic sort of air freshener smell that Liberia smells so earthy and raw and it smells like dried fish and it smells like sweat and it smells like burnt coal fires and it smells like home. It smells like Africa. And I remember walking on the plane and that plane smelled like perfume and it smelled like, I don't know, Glade. And I still, it's really weird that I can, I can smell the way the plane smelled versus the way home felt. And I, you know, I was, remember as the plane um, took off. My mom hadn't cried in the, I hadn't seen my mother cry in the entire month of what had happened in Liberia. And as the plane took off, she just started to heave, you know, these, ra these racking sobs. And it's a very, you know, it's like, there's so many things in my life I don't remember. That night I remember really sharply. Yeah. Um, this is a tough question to ask, but do you, do you feel some guilt about the Liberia that your ancestors built? Yeah, I feel a lot. There, there's a lot of ambivalence. I feel pride and I feel guilt. And it's this, you know, that's taken me a long time to sort of work through. I'm so incredibly proud of them that they got on that ship and that they, you know, they, if it weren't for them, I don't know where I would be right now. Um, and I look at what they built and I am, you know, I, I remember when I found Elijah Johnson's journal, the one that he kept when he was on that ship in 1820. And I was at the, I found it through these diary, these papers at the Library of Congress, and I was shaking as I'm reading it. And you can see his handwriting, and he's, a lot of he's writing as he's at sea. And there was this one passage that blew me away. He said, today while we were up on deck, John Fisher whipped his wife. I think this is a very dull lamp for me to be carrying with me into a dark continent, but I have not lost faith in my God. And I think he was enormously strong. Um, but at the same time, I, there is a lot of ambivalence because I wish they could have been. I wish the system that they set up had not been. I wish they had looked at the native Africans as their brothers and sisters and not this you know, superior class type structure. But at the same time, I also know that that's sort of, you know, we're all human beings. And this is one of the things that sort of, you know, we all can look back at what our ancestors did and not be, you know, sort of how it's made me a lot more, a lot less black and white about racism, a lot less black and white about, you know, a lot of things that have happened, you know, in the past because I know that it's sort of a part of all of us and we can just keep trying to improve upon ourselves. As one reviewer called this book, it's a masterful memoir. I like that review. I like it too. <laughs> I like it too. <laughs> And it was dead on, and, 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 by, and incidentally, it was written by a woman who, uh, two years before she wrote it, won the Pulitzer Prize for, for a novel that she wrote. Yeah. So it was, it was by a, it, it wasn't some fluffy uh, review, it was, no. it was very serious. One of the things I think that's so masterful about this book is the rhythms of it, the, the language of it, the, the, the richness of the family relationships. One thing I wanted to ask you on a later note is, is there's plenty of times in the book which I think any of us who have Siblings can really identify with Molly, coming for you. And Marlene, Marlene's <laughs> here. Now, now in, in this book, Marlene, uh, uh, Helene talks about Marlene's yucky room, uh, her annoying little sister, all these things. So, so this book has these wonderful, very personal inner family relationships. And, and you can tell from, from th that this is a really close family. Tell us about what's happened to all the, the relatives now and uh, you know, where is everybody? Is everybody in the United States? There's some people that made it over here, some people didn't. Um, we're pretty much, we're scattered all over the place. My mom lives in Alexandria, Virginia, very close to me and very close to Marlene. Uh, Eunice is in Liberia. Uh, she made her first visit here last year. 
Uh, and it was it was awesome. She's yeah. a Bintu now. She's a total Bintu now. She thinks she's like Miss Cool. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, my father died in 1985, but my brother is in Atlanta. I have a sister in New York, and then I have hundreds of cousins. The Cooper family is ginormous and I you know when I was doing my book tour in September and October I'm like traveling all over the country and I swear I had there were Coopers coming out of like Seattle I'm like what are you doing here in Seattle you know it was it's so it's um it's a huge 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 family and it they've been they've been great I was really nervous about how my family was going to take the book I was nervous about I wanted for my mom and Marlene and Eunice to be okay with it and they they were great um I was much more certain that the larger Cooper family would be very skittish. Why am I writing this? Why am I dredging all this stuff out? Uh, and by and large, you know, they've amazed me. They've been so awesome. They've been so, like, it's so cool that they've been proud of me. I've always felt like I was the one member of the family who was always, like, messing up and all of, <laughs> and all of that because they're all very, you know, they can be pretty, you know, pompous. <laughs> <laughs> but so it's you know it's it the, the part about actually you know making my family proud that I've like sat down and I've chronicled you know where we came came from and all of that has been really it's been really cool. When you returned to Liberia for the first time, it was as if everybody in Liberia who was still there knew exactly what you were doing in life. That Don't that's what well, that that was the weirdest thing. I mean, they were all like they the, there are these people there who are going through year who've gone through years of civil war and all this stuff, and they're like. Oh my God! You were in Iraq. We heard you were in Iraq. How did you manage? Blah blah. blah. No <laughs> there, I was like, "Hello, there's child soldiers standing there on amphetamines, you know, holding you guys up with an AK-47. You're worried about me in Iraq? Yeah. It was very. It's like this complete, you know. No phones. No phones. No electricity. No, no, electricity, been no, electricity, no running water. No, no newspaper. No, no TV. No. And they know and that Helene like, Cooper yeah, writes for yeah, the New York Times. Well, yes. Yes. That yeah. says something about you, and it says something about this is this Liberia. is the funny perfect coda to end this. Um, I got moved to the White House uh, beat for the New York Times uh, when Obama got elected, and during his first news conference, uh, he called on me. Right. So it was that televised news conference, and I was you know I was just I was completely nervous and all that. And I asked my question, he completely blew it off and like moved on. <laughs> and after that, I walked out of there and my phone is just like going crazy. And it was one after another Liberia <laughs> call me. They're like, we're so proud. This is such a big day for Liberia. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> I was like, that's, yeah. That so, is fantastic. Yeah. That part yeah. is cool. I, I like to, there, there's some wonderful journalists in this room right now and there's, a bunch of uh, colleagues and friends. I'd like to open it up for some questions. But before I do that, I, I, I want to welcome um, our young colleagues here. We have uh, Meherit Morrison, uh, my colleague Steve Morrison's daughter, and her friends from school, and they have a book club. And I think this is the next book you guys are going to read, right? Yeah. Great. Well, <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Let's open it up for some questions. I think Ann Garrett's here. I think Ann wants to ask a question. You're going to put Ann on the spot? Yeah. That is, like, so mean. Because <laughs> this is a perfect chance for... Well, actually, I, I sort of came prepared. I'll, I'll, I'll ask a question that is sort of um, through me from my mother-in-law, who recently read your book after I gave it to her for Christmas. She's very impressed to have a signed copy. And she asked, a, she asked me what you had thought when you were in Iraq about your, the war that you weren't in. And I know you've talked about this a little bit, and you talk about it some in the book, but I, I wondered if you would be willing to talk a little bit about what that at that time you thought before you wrote the book. Um, the, there's something very, there's a lot about Iraq that it reminded me of Liberia. Um, and you would see we'd be going in this convoy through these Iraqi villages and towns and people would come to the road and look at us. And there were so many times that that happened when I would imagine, you know, people in Liberia coming up to the road, you know, and looking at, at sort of the soldiers, but knowing also that in Liberia it was so much worse than what was happening in, in, in Iraq. I mean, the war in Liberia is like no other you know, I can't even begin to describe there. You have rebel soldiers who are dressed up 
in wedding gowns and blonde wigs because they believe that that's sort of magic and that's going to protect them from from bullets and you have you know amphetamine fueled soldiers and you have kids who were kidnapped from their mothers and dragged off to to be soldiers in this war and people are fighting and not knowing what they're fighting fighting for and it's so in so many ways it was so, it, it, it's so surreal um, that I it almost felt sometimes like the Iraq war was the organized war and this is how you know this is how white people fight wars and I'm thinking in my mind that you know that's not how we fight wars in Liberia that's not how we fight in Africa you know and, and they, they, this sort of this is this like disconnect that I just kept thinking you know what am I am I have I become so Americanized that I can't deal with you know with where I come from and so there was a lot of that going on when I was in Iraq did it feel bittersweet when you got your US citizenship Did you feel like you were abandoning your country yeah but I did but happy. I was also really happy you know at that when I the, at the point that I got my citizenship was 1997 I was really in complete disconnect mode I was you know Liberia wasn't happening. I had just, I had shut it down. I was going to be American. I was going to have a, you know, I hated, I traveled so much for work at the time, and I had to get a visa to cross the street with my Liberian passport, and people would look at it like, you know, what is this? Um, and I just wanted to be done with it. I wanted the American passport. I wanted to know that, you know, if I was ever anywhere dangerous, and they'd evacuate me with the rest of the American citizens. <laughs> like, but it was, you know, but it, it wasn't until, a long time later when I finally went back to Liberia and I went in to the um, um, the plane landed and I'm at Roberts Field I'm going through uh, immigration and I give the man my passport it's the American passport and he looks at it and he looks up at me and he was like Cooper and I said yeah and he was like you're not no American woman and I'm I just sort of looked at him and smiled because it's like you know I've been in the United States at that point for 23 years and he totally pinned me as Liberian Wow. Uh, you know, w one thing I wanted to ask you also is, is you know, uh, well, well, actually, before we even get to that, tell us what happened when you were covering the State Department and you went on a trip with Madeleine Albright with your Liberian passport. You just want me to speak. You're just trying to get me to speak Liberian English. I, I am. <laughs> I, I really am. Because when you read this book, you, it, it reminds me of uh, my time in New Orleans where there's the dialects yeah, in New Orleans like, that are much like... Tell, tell us what happened um, with, uh, with this was, um, there are two stories. One, um, I had been, um, I was covering commerce or something for the Wall Street Journal, and Ron Brown was going to China, and I was going with him. And I took my Liberian passport to the Commerce Department, and they were going to, um, uh, uh, so they could get the visas and all of that. And they called me the next day, and they were like, this is a Liberian passport. I was like, yeah, so what? And they're just sort of like, we've just never seen one of these before. Is it real? <laughs> And I remember coming back from another trip, uh, coming back from Singapore, and I had gotten my American passport at that point. And I went through Hawaii, and this, again, I'm going through passport control. And the guy looked at me and said, you know, welcome home. And I started crying, and I felt very American. And then I remember once with Al Madeleine Albright. It was during the run-up to the Kosovo War, and she was doing all this flying all over the place. And... Um, we have this saying in Liberia that we used to have whenever we, um, we went to movies. It's called, uh, whenever we saw like big action uh, blockbuster movies uh, that showed stuff that you never believed could actually happen. And in Liberia, we'll say, white man can lie, oh. It means <laughs> white man can lie. Uh, and that's because that, was, that phrase was coined back when Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. And that's because... No Liberian believes that Neil Armstrong. Walk on the moon. Yeah, no. <laughs> so Neil walk, he's like up there walking, and right, all Liberians right. are like, "Eh, white man can love." <laughs> so I'm in the doomsday plane with Madeleine Albright, and we were somewhere over Syria or something. I don't remember where we were going. And uh, the, this Marine comes up to me, and he comes and he taps me on my shoulder in the middle up. of the night. He woke me up, and he's like, "We're refueling. Do you want to come see?" Because I had told him earlier that I was like, "Are you really? How do you refuel midair?" And he, I had asked him to come, so he takes me up, and I'm like, and they're attaching this hose to one plane. It's under the other plane, and it's like, and I'm looking out the window, and I was like, and this is in the middle of my complete American, you know, 
And I looked at that thing, and I was like, eh, what make you lie? <laughs> and it's like thinking, well, actually, they are, actually are doing it. So it's just like, maybe Neil Armstrong actually did walk on the moon. <laughs> right. It's like, like, you know. Well, Marlene's here. Marlene, do you want to ask your sister a question? <laughs> it should if there are any takers publishers you know I'm, I'm happy I'm, I'm happy to start discussions now tonight somebody take the microphone away from her um, you I, I think you had a you question, question right in the front? back there right over it. So I'm going to fumble over this a little bit, but it seemed like when you're describing Sugar Beach and Liberia, it was, everything was bright, and it seemed like there was never a cloudy, rainy day. And that when you came to the States and when you're writing about Knoxville and, and you know, uh, Greensboro, it seemed like everything was a rainy day, kind of dreary, and your description of Greensboro just seemed really particularly stark. Could you tell I didn't like it? <laughs> I didn't like Knoxville. So when did, when did the United States kind of feel like it was home? When did it feel like, wow... It's sunny here. It's kind of this is my place. That's a that's actually a really good question. It started in it started in Greensboro. Uh, Knox. We got to we went to Knoxville for the first year, and yeah, it was cloudy in Knoxville. Never just rain. No sun in Knoxville. As far as I was concerned, I was miserable. Um, uh, I used to hide in the um, uh, the bathroom during lunchtime because I didn't have any friends to sit and eat with in the cafeteria at school. I know it's but that's. <laughs> Finally, I connected with you. Okay. <laughs> Will you guys take Colleen to school for lunch one day? It's like I just need to redo. I think but I would sit in the toilet stall and I would like close the door and I would just sit there and it was a way to get through like lunch. Um, and then uh, we moved to Greensboro the next year, and uh, 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 we're living with my dad then, and my mom had gone back home, and that was really hard for both me and Marlene because for the first time now we had you know our mom was not there. Um, and that was really difficult, but I slowly, by then I'm in the 11th grade, and I started uh, to make friends. This one boy in my chemistry class, I still remember it so clear to me when I walked into chemistry class on the first day of school, and he said to me, you're following me, because he had been in my algebra class before that, and it was like the first really friendly thing somebody had said, and I just felt like, you know, it's, it's so important to you at that age to just not be weird. And in Knoxville, I was the weird African girl. And all I wanted in, like, in Greensboro was to just be like everybody else. I just, and to have a friend and to have like, and that was like a big deal. And the sun sort of started to come out for me in Greensboro. Um, uh, by the time I graduated from high school, I was pretty, and it, this is part of the, you know, sort of the weird psychologic journey or whatever, because I found like, and this is part of why I ended up distancing myself so much more from Liberia was that I realized that the more American I acted, the less weird I seemed with everybody else and the easier it seemed for me to have friends. So in my mind there was this, you know, if you can just become more American and be more like the other kids, you know, you, you can have friends and you'll be, you know, and that was part of the whole you know, distancing myself from Liberia as I became more American. And it's like, you don't really become, you're not really, you know, complete unless you can be all of who you are. Now that's, I'm totally botching that up, but, yes. Um, was it really hard? <laughs> was it hard for you to, like, make the transition between, like, the Liberian culture and then coming to America where it's, like, totally different? It, it, yes and no. Um, in Liberia, we love Americans, and we used to. I went to the American school in Liberia, so I used to practice before I went to school in the morning. I would stand in the mirror and I would practice American accent. I'd say, "Hi there, how are you? What's happening, blood?" And so I told her, I thought I could speak with an American accent. By the time I got to what did you all call that speaking? Kolo, talking Kolo. <laughs> um, uh, so when I got to uh, Knoxville, it was um, I could I could I could fake it. I just didn't really want to fake it as much at first, and then I sort of realized that I needed to fake it in order to to be uh, more accepted by everybody else. 
the cultural thing was really was was hard though. There were parts that were easy because I could fake the accent, I could do the accent, um, and there were parts that were really hard. And I really, you know, but, but part of it was just mostly like I just really missed I missed my family and I missed home, you know, and I missed the food and I missed the smells, you know. But the United States can be very seductive, you know. It doesn't take that's why people keep coming here. It doesn't take that long to sort of learn that it, in a lot of ways things in America are just easier. You know, there, it's just so much easier than, than living in Liberia. When you ended up going to college, you went to Chapel Hill, North University of North Carolina, mm -hmm. and you were, by then you were pretty much Americanized. Yeah, yeah. By Everything the time I got basketball to, and by the time, yeah, I threw myself into and Carolina and Tar Heels, and yeah, I was, I was very, very Americanized by then. Did, now, I have a question. One of the, you mentioned that in Liberia you had, um, you always had access to American cultural things, and um, your mom would bring videos of Mary Tyler Moore. Is that why mm -hmm. you wanted to become a reporter? No. <laughs> Mary Tyler Moore? No, I decided I wanted, it was Brit Hume, remember? Oh, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Brit Hume. No, when we, first moved to, when we first moved to the U.S., uh, I used to watch the ABC World News Tonight, and I would yes. see Brit Hume in front of the State Department uh, with all the flags behind him, and I was like, ooh, I want to be like him. And then I read All the President's Men in 11th grade, and I was hooked after that. I really, you know, and journalism was, you know, from that moment on, it was, I, I never wanted to do anything else but that. That's great. Questions? Yes. Um, um, you mentioned food earlier. What was it like for you, like, when you're, like, eating the American food? Because I know, like, it's really strange. It, 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 <laughs> I thought it was bland because I was so used to um, spicy Liberian food. Um, so my mom, I remember when we first moved here in Knoxville, she would make uh, American-style soup out of the can with Campbell's, that kind of stuff. And I thought, you know, I'm used to my Liberian pepper soup. Uh, but, you know, after a while you start to. But Liberian food is so good. It's so flavorful and it's got a lot of spice in it and always has a kick. In Liberia, we don't believe that food is really good unless it hurts while you eat it. It hurts as, as in, you know, you should be crying, your nose should be running, and all that means it's good. It's the heart that makes it good. All right, let's go to Elise. I think what's interesting is all this talk about how Helene embraced the American culture because those of us that are friends with her see her as really still Liberian and a lot of talking Liberian and Liberian food and and things like that. So I'm wondering at what point you kind of felt that it was okay to, was it after you traveled and, and saw Eunice and wrote the book that you were able to embrace your kind of Liberian-ness again and become a whole person? Because I think that your Liberian and heritage is still very strong to you and it your is, family yeah, here. Yeah. It never, it, it, I never really left it. And I think I felt it was okay. After, when I was in, once I got away from the whole teenage years and college where, you, where you're trying to fit in. Once I got away from that, um, uh, I could be, you know, I could be, I was all, I was never American when I was home. You know, even in, during my teenage years and even when I was going through, you know, high school and college and faking my accent and all of that, when I went home, I was talking to my dad and my sister and we're Liberian. And so it just, it took, I think it's all part of the growing up and becoming an adult that you realize you're just going to be who you are and it's totally fine to be to be to be who you are but I never really I just learned how to I guess what I did is I stopped separating the two and it was much more that and letting people realizing that I wasn't being fair to my American friends pretending that I was one thing when I'm actually not and letting them into my the Liberian part of my life and 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 vice versa you know sometimes I used to think that I had to, uh, you know, I had to have my Liberian friends and I had to have my Li American friends. I could never, like, mix the two. And it was kind of, it took a long time to just realize that this is all, you know, it's fine to just throw people together. We have a question right up here in the front next to Elise. Hi. Um, we, we talked briefly before the session. First of all, I want to say thank you for doing the book uh, and for sharing so honestly, and as you were talking, my mind is, is flashing uh, because you really represent, you know, three traditions. You're on, firstly, you're African American because that was your heritage here. Then you're Liberian. 
that's where you grew up, but then you're African American again. So you really span these cultures in uh, a very unique way. Now, I'm involved, as I mentioned to you, with the Maryland State Liberian Sister State Relationship. And one of the things we're trying to do is to, again, make folks aware of the relationship, these long historical relationships between the United States, and in this case, the state of Maryland, and Liberia. The county in Liberia called Maryland was founded, as you know, by freed uh, African Americans from the state of Maryland. So my question is, given your uh, history and what you've seen, uh, I'd be interested in your ideas about how to bridge the gap between African Americans and Africans in this country that exists right now. Uh, it's, you know, I would really like to see uh, African Americans just pay more attention to Africa in general. Um, you go to Liberia and um, people there know about here. It's the other way around that people here don't know about there. You know, I, I grew up completely immersed in American culture and Michael Jackson albums and all of that sort of thing. You go to Liberia now and you're going to see, you know, you go all over the world. You know, American culture is one of those things that, that is very, is very alive, is our, our biggest export. And in Liberia, there's no, you know, there's no, you, 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 they, get, they get that, you know, there. They're so excited about Barack Obama and they're so, you know, you, you see so much of that there. I found that the other, it doesn't flow the other way. So many of my black friends didn't know when I met them here, you know, my African American friends could, you know, had no idea what Liberia was or what, you know, and, and could not have, you know, it's not, they're, they're just not plugged in. So I would like to see, you know, be my wish to see uh, African Americans here engage more because it's going to have to come from here. You know, there are so many, they're so, it's like, you know, this, this is a, these are third world countries. There's just, a, the, the engagement has to start over here and it has to start with sort of the interest in these, particularly in the West, in West Africa, but the interest. And I think, I, I, I think probably, I think Obama and his story is going to go a long way, you know, towards that. I, I want to follow up on that for a minute before we take a few more from the audience. Um, Liberia has really come a long way, um, and I'm told, you know, Bob Johnson's building a hotel in Liberia. And, but I'm also told by um, some of the people who are building that hotel with Bob Johnson that um, you can't imagine what it's like there when you live in the United mm -hmm. States and you go back. And it's, they still have a long way to go. Um, can you talk about the leadership of Ellen Johnson Sirleaf and what's happening there now? Um, the election of Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, uh, first woman president um, uh, elected uh, in an African country, is huge. I can't even begin to just say just how big a deal that is just because in uh, all over the continent, women drive that, women literally carry Africa on their back. These women are the strongest women that you will ever meet. They've been through so much. They've been, you know, raped and they've been, you know, harassed and they've been, you know, forced into pregnancy, raped and left pregnant in the forest and they have their babies and they put those babies on their back and they keep going. Their kids are kidnapped from them and taken off to be child soldiers and they keep going. They take those kids back and they, they fight and they're the market women who are sitting out on the side of the road and they're selling oranges and they're the women who like when all the men are going out there and they're fighting and they're doing this and they're doing that, these women are functional and they're, they're, they're high spirited and they're out there and they're still having their kids and they're still raising their families. And they're, they're, and for them to, after all of these years of, of being targeted, of being abused, of being, to turn around and to see a woman elected president is, is so huge to actually get something back like this. It was women that elected Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, and it's such a huge, it's such a huge thing. And for it to happen in my country, you know, I think it's such a shining example all over Africa, where which is still so paternalistic and it's so it's so male dominated. Um, so I think just for that, even if she was the worst president ever, and she's not by far because that's not you know, um, it's it's so huge. Um, but she has a huge hole to dig out of. This country is coming out of 23 years 
of completely pointless pointless wars. It's um it's got such a hole to dig out of. It's still no electricity. There's still no running water. It's like the reconstruction effort in Liberia is going to take years and years. And so anybody who starts to measure it in months or you know is you know is not. So I think I, I'm glad to see it in her hands because I think she's going to smoke any of the people, her predecessors, so that's not that hard to do. Um, but I, I also hope people are realistic about just how quickly this can come back. It's starting to come back, but it's, gonna it's, it's, it's going to be hard. It's going to be an amazing experience for you when one day you land in uh, Liberia with the White House press corps mm. and go into Liberia and the President of the United States meets with the President of Liberia. Last time this happened, you were seven. I was no, I was twelve. You're I was 12. on the side of the road with Jimmy Carter, and we wanted to see Amy. Yeah, <laughs> and she drove by really fast. I never even saw her, but we pretended we did. But you and you, yeah, stopped, we yeah. pretended we were very excited. And where was Marlene when that was happening? Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> we we have time for a couple more. I know that. Uh, um, a lot of you want to say hello to her in person, so we'll take a couple more. We have uh, one in the back there. Monica? <laughs> um, you spoke about when you were uh, younger having this kind of embarrassment about, um, you know, wanting to fit in and having and being embarrassed about being from Liberia when you were a kid. But then when you talked about the press conference, um, which I saw you ask your question, um, you talked about the pride. It seems like you have a lot of pride about being from Liberia, and obviously Liberians have a lot of uh, are proud to see you so successful. But my question is, is it hard for you that you speak now with such an American accent? And when I look at you, I had no idea that you were Liberian until I heard about this book. So do you feel, a, um, I guess, how do you feel about when the ordinary American looks at you that they don't, know that this rich history that you have and do you feel like you've lost something by you know not having an accent um so i'm just curious your thoughts um i think i probably i do have an accent that my accent is still there when i'm speaking with my family and when i'm speaking with liberians it would seem forced if i tried to do it on a daily basis with americans um, because I've read somewhere that at the age of, if you move before the age of 15, you lose your accent, and if you move after, you don't. My mom sounds completely Liberian. Um, I, old, I have older cousins who moved here after 15, and they sound completely Liberian, whereas Marlene and I sound American. When my brother, who was 18 when he moved here, can, he can kind of do the American, but he sounds, you, he, has, he has a slight accent when you when you talk to him. Now, if I, if I were talking to my family people, I would be talking with Liberian accent, and not that hard for me to do. And I still still not a dream with my Liberian accent while dreaming. But <laughs> it's completely, it would, be fa it would be forced for me to do it if I'm in a press conference, because I, you know, from the time I was, <laughs> I should try that, though, next time. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No, that I don't feel. A lot of people think, I mean, I'm not in any, I don't look at myself in any way as a role model for anybody. I'm just, you know, I, you know, I wouldn't even begin to, to want to be. Um, so, no. Well, I was the person who made us bring the alcohol up here. You were the way. one who was, like, serving yeah, Pat's Blue yeah, Ribbon yeah, beer yeah, here. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, no, I've never, I, and that's partly, you know, it, it, it sounds a little bit like I'm, you know, um, I, I don't think a lot of, Reporters look at themselves as, you know, standing as examples for anything. We're much more, we want to chronicle life, and we want to write about life the way it is. And this is basically the way I am. And I don't feel, I've never felt, that's probably why I'm not in politics, and you'll never see me in politics, but I've never felt like I have a responsibility to serve as a role model or to carry my country. What I want to do is I want to be able to tell the story of my country, and I want to be able to tell the story of you know of other people and people you know who are, I want to be able to tell this story, but I don't feel like I'm an example for anybody. Great. Let's take one more over here. Uh, 
I'm John Casebolt uh, here at CSIS. Uh, I've got a brother-in-law from Tennessee, and I'm surprised you stayed in America. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, he's from Eastern Tennessee, real close to Knoxville. I'm not even touching that one. <laughs> <laughs> but I lost my mother when I was 11, and my half brother and I were separated. So I can understand your, you know, relationship with Eunice. Um, after 25 years, I've got one friend from high school that he and I are still really close and keep in touch with. And I was wondering if you were able to find a friend like that when you came to America. I do. I found uh, I have I have one of my best friends is one who in Greensboro, North Carolina, uh, we were in the same drama class uh, together, Allison Young. And we went to uh, Chapel Hill together, uh, University of North Carolina. and. She is still, to this day, uh, probably my best friend. That's a great way to end. Um, we want to thank Helene we, Can we get one oh, yeah, yeah, more of from, yeah, yeah. just because Jen is Liberian? Yeah, yeah, can you do it in yeah. a Liberian accent? OK, or right, I'll answer you in a Liberian accent, too. I'm going to hear my question. That's all right. But the thing I want to ask you is, I read about your first heartbreak. Hey, man, I feel it, Paula. You got me to talk about? <laughs> here. I want to know. What do you want to know? We bought cell I want to know as a young librarian growing up here and just dating and falling in love, I want to know where you are now. How is it going? How are you? <laughs> <laughs> All right. She, didn't, she doesn't get it. <laughs> we can go now. <laughs> I am so the last person anybody should come to for dating advice because <laughs> I have the worst, worst, worst record ever. <laughs> so um, I think you should just be who you are, you know? And if you end up with an American guy, so what? Your parents will deal with it. You can come home with a Nigerian and they'll deal with it. And that's saying something. <laughs> I think we have to end now. All right, okay. <laughs> We, we. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Helene Cooper. Thank you.